Well, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all for coming. Um, I just thought as I was listening to Jonathan, I had a book called uh, The Construction of Reality. Now, given your interests, I should write a book called The Reality of Construction. Um, I imagine that most of your visitors comment on the fact that this is the third Cambridge they have visited. And yesterday, I thought I would be able to bring the count up to four because I spent time in Cambridge, New Zealand. But thanks to Google Earth, I can report my count is up to five because there is the suburb of Cambridge on the way from Hobart Airport to downtown Hobart in Tasmania. So uh, I would like to claim the record for number of Cambridges. And uh, you know, if there is a Cambridge in China, maybe or India, we can, we can add that later. Okay, so I have to apologize. The, um, I have been working so much on developing this talk that the title has almost nothing to do with what I will discuss. So in thinking about the conversation between neuroscience and architecture, uh, I've sort of tried to divide it in three ways. I think the dominant theme is the experience of architecture. What happens as people are in architected spaces or in an urban space? And what's going on in their brain? Whether you study that in terms of actual brain mechanisms or, or a more abstract cognitive analysis. But that feeds into the neuroscience of the design process because as the architect designs a building, um, not only are they worrying about the design per se, but they're trying to imagine the experience of the people who will use the building in the future. But I'm actually going to emphasize something rather weird, uh, which is this idea of brains for buildings. What happens if a building has the ability to interact with you? When I started working on this, this was fairly futuristic. Now, as everybody has their household personal computational assistant and so on, it becomes a little bit more part of our, our normal experience. But I'm going to focus on two things. One is what I'll call bow culture. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, but the, the culture of building in a cybernetic age of strife. And then because I'm interested in buildings with brains, I'm going to go back to Le Corbusier and discuss his idea of a house is a machine for living in and talk quite a bit about, well, what happens if that machine is not a machine in the sense that Corbusier was thinking about, but is a cybernetic machine. So that, that's basically the story for today. Now you've already met, uh, as it were, Colin Ellard, um, who is here all the way from uh, Waterloo. And um, amazingly, when the uh, culture ministers of Europe got together and came up with this declaration on pathways for politically and strategically promoting high-quality bow culture in Europe, um, Colin was there to give the keynote address. So you have a, a very distinguished uh, colleague here. But I want to pick up on this in a rather different way fr from the way that Colin has picked up on. So here's the, the basic story. A society's particular culture of building, how they go about creating their built environments, is complemented by the building of this culture, how the quality of what they do and what they produce can be raised. So in other words, we have a historical or a cultural heritage that affects the way we build, but as we build, we are developing the culture. And, and so I, I want to, to start with a, a, a non-existent street sign. Should, we, should Paris have banned the Eiffel Tower? It was so contrary to the culture of France and Paris of the day that, in fact, a lot of people at the time argued it should not be built, and yet it's become an icon. Um, so, so this notion of taking culture seriously and asking in what sense new buildings can develop the culture or cut across it. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the opening question. And so a society's culture is dynamic. So to what extent do new buildings add to the dynamics of the culture, and to what extent do they, in some sense, destroy uh, that? The second thing is to go from the plural that today most societies do not have one culture, they have multiple. And so the, the next question is, for example, if you build a mosque 
in a society that has a traditionally Christian culture, although it's probably more uh, less observant than it was, is the mosque a symbol of cultural breadth or a stimulus for hatred? And so I picked three pictures. One is the new um, mosque, Grand Mosque in Cologne, uh, contrasted with the centuries-old Cologne Cathedral. So to what extent does that enrich the culture of Cologne? To what extent does it work against it? And of course, the, the two uh, pictures here of uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, remind us of the recent massacre in um, Christchurch in New Zealand, uh, a case of um, uh, the mosque as a symbol for hatred rather than a symbol for cultural integration. And I think it's very interesting to look at these two slides. So in this one, uh, Jacinda is, is wearing a veil to uh, express her solidarity as a New Zealander with those New Zealanders of, of Muslim origin. But I don't know how many of you saw this picture and realized that in this speech uh, of reconciliation with the Muslims, she's wearing a Maori cloak. And so that's the symbol of the fact that when the Europeans came in, although they had a treaty with the, the, the natives, the, the Polynesians, the Maoris, uh, to a great extent they destroyed the Maori culture. And now it's very much a part of New Zealand's nation building to restore the Maori culture, but in integration with the European culture of, of, of the settlers. So I think this is a, a setting um, for thinking about bow culture, not just in terms of you know, how, how do we make buildings nice to live in, but, but how do we express the continuity of culture when there are multiple cultures and create, a, as it were, a meta-culture in which these diverse cultures can live together. I'm not going to really answer the question, but I felt it was important that we had it in front of us uh, as we proceed further. So just a few more questions that, as we think about bow culture, is preserving versus forgetting culture. As you know, um, a major question in the United States at the moment is to what extent are Confederate memorials um, really memorials that support slavery? And therefore, to what extent sh should we try to forget that part of the culture rather than preserve it? Um, a lot of uh, our intensity in architecture these days goes to looking at beautiful buildings, uh, star architecture and so on. Um, a lot of the development of cities is pushing the workers out from the center further and further into the periphery. So this issue of creating a culture in which we improve the overall culture while respecting the rights of all the different members of that culture. And then uh, the thing that I will talk more about, but not enough given the time we have, will be how does technology, I use cybernetics as I'll say as a sort of umbrella term, but how does it support the spread and growth of culture? How does it affect the nature of, of buildings? So before I, I leave this issue of having multiple cultures, I want to pick up on a word that um, has always struck me as the word that is appropriate to the ideal of the European Union, although not always observed, and one that you can think about in the Canadian or the US context of a federal government. And, and it's called the principle of subsidiarity. And it's basically the idea that if something can be done locally, then the, the larger structure should not interfere. So in, in Europe, that would be in particular, a country should decide what it's doing with its culture unless that interferes with something overall at the level of Europe. But on the other hand, the European Union or the federal government should nonetheless act when the individual entities cannot achieve that for themselves. And so interestingly, this goes back to Pope Pius XI, who said, of its very nature, the true aim of all social activity should be to help individual members of the social body, but never to destroy or absorb them, for example, by telling them they can't use contraception. No, the Pope would never want to do that. So might this nation, I, I'm not sure what that word potova it is, but I, anyway, you can figure it out, a framework for the bow culture. So I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that in some sense that has to be 
the overarching framework. And I, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to come back and tell you how to establish that. But that idea of how do we reconcile individual interests, where can locality do it, Unfortunately, as we know, often the planning commission is just a, a way for developers to make more money out of what's happening rather than to respect the local needs. But, but I think that's a, a good thing to bear in mind as you locate your individual buildings within a, a, an overall setting. But I'm going to narrow the focus. I, I want to look at this particular thing from the context document from, from the Davos statement about digitalization. The fourth industrial revolution has begun. The vision of interconnectedness between virtual and physical devices in a global network, the internet of things. Okay, so, so the idea is that we, we're going in future to be having more and more uh, in which the internet shapes our buildings. And, and, and so the historical thing for me is to think about what happened when cities for the first time, well actually for the second time, because they had it in the Roman Empire, but when they brought back the idea of having municipal water systems and sewage systems, and how suddenly the design of buildings changed because there were actually a need to put a bathroom in connected to the system, or gas and electricity coming in. So now we have a new utility, namely an information utility, and at the moment that's more we put devices in buildings that were built without that in mind. What happens in the future, perhaps as architecture changes, to take advantage of that. And I, I, I'm sort of disappointed. I'd hope to be further along in answering my own question. But at least pay, maybe if I can raise the question with you, you can think more about it. But anyway, I'd been working on this for quite a while and thinking about buildings with sort of, quotes, brains. And there was this slogan I'd heard again and again, a house is a machine for living in, from Le Corbusier. And I thought, hey, maybe it's time I went back and, and read his book and uh, towards a new architecture and um, see what it might mean uh, for, for this notion of, of cybernetic buildings. So, so let's start with the two English translations. Uh, so there was a series of, of articles that Corbusier wrote, uh, perhaps with his colleagues. Uh, they were collected in 1921. Um, the first translation in English came out here. Um, and then in 2007, people who felt that the first translator didn't get it quite right put out a new translation. And what I want to, to emphasize for what I'm going to say in the next few slides is this very nice um, juxtaposition of the motor car of the 1920s um, and the Parthenon. And in fact, as you read the book, you find a duality at times Corbusier is getting high on the engineering aesthetic, what happens as you build beautiful machines whose beauty emerges from their function. And yet, in other parts of the book, he goes back to the Parthenon and says, oh, forget what it was built for. It's beautiful in and of itself. And, and, and so that's the thing. Sometimes people talk more about the function of a building. Sometimes they talk more about the, the beauty of a building or the aesthetics of a building. Clearly, our concern is to bring function and, and emotion together. So let's see how the pieces sort of sat separately 100 years ago for Corbusier and, and bear that in mind as we proceed forward. So here is his declaration in 1920. A great epoch is beginning. Um, and nobody's day can deny the aesthetic which is disengaging itself from the creations of modern industry. More and more buildings and machines are growing up in which the proportions, the play of their masses, and the materials used are of such a kind that many of them are real works of art. Now, the specialized persons who make up the world of industry and business are amongst the most active creators of contemporary aesthetics. So, in particular, he talked about uh, ocean liners, airplanes, and automobiles. And his idea was that the needs to build an economical, efficient machine were creating a new engineering aesthetics. And that was what he was proclaiming at first. So he looked at an ocean liner, um, but he also looked at this picture of the deck of an ocean liner. And what he was doing here was um, not so much 
examining for us the way in which the function of efficient propulsion through the water was reflecting in the marine architecture shown at left, but he was looking at this spacious sunlit deck and saying, what a contrast with the windows in our houses making holes in the walls and forming a patch of shade on either side. The result is a dismal room and the light seems so hard and unsympathetic that curtains are indispensable in order to soften it. So here we're seeing him railing against a certain type of domestic architecture that in great extent with the advances in steel and glass we've solved. Um, but the issue is, as I say, at left, I would say that's the engineering aesthetic. At right, this is somebody designing a deck for a fairly expensive ocean liner. Um, and the efficiency of the machine, the boat, uh, the machine for traveling across water, is not really affecting what's involved. I love these pictures of the airplanes that he chose, and especially the, the triple hydroplane Caproni. I checked it out on web, web on uh, Wikipedia, it turned out it only flew once and crashed. But um, I think if you look at it, you can see it's a desperate effort to get more lift, but it certainly doesn't give you an engineering aesthetic that you have too much confidence in for guiding. But anyway, what he's saying, uh, as I would think in retrospect, knowing modern aeroplanes, uh, let's not get into the latest Boeing 37, 737, but anyway, the, hair, the airplane is the product of close selection. The lesson of the airplane lies in the logic which governs statement of the problem and its realization. So e even though we may laugh at these particular uh, airplanes, especially the one on the right, uh, given our modern knowledge, there was the idea that, hey, if the plane doesn't fly and if it can't carry its load, then it's not an airplane. And so the issue is you could then state a problem to be realized when you were designing an airplane. And his claim was that 100 years ago, the problem of the house has not yet been stated. But there do exist standards. And then he says the house is a machine for living in. Now it's sort of fun to read what goes on from there because he makes recommendations like um, don't put your maid in the attic. And so, it's, so there's very much a French bourgeois view of what a home is like as he makes his other recommendations that we would feel we're in more agreement with. And he says, you shouldn't change your clothes in the bedroom. So, you know. Okay, so, so let's just finish with the automobile. Um, if the problem of the dwelling or the flat were studied in the same way that a chassis is, a speedy transformation and improvement would be seen to our houses. If houses were constructed by industrial mass production, like chassis, um, then it would be a good thing. And so just sort of analyzing that a little bit more, his, his big manifesto at that time um, was for the notion of a mass production house. And so I think this may be getting close to the other side of the bow culture thing, not thinking so much in preserving traditional cultures, but in making a clean break with the idea of what makes a house a good place to live in or an apartment a good place to live in. So he says, I really like this, men live in old houses and they have not yet thought of building houses adapted to themselves. The lair has been dear to their hearts since all the time. Well, the reason I'm amused is because one of my architecture colleagues recommended strongly Heidegger's building dwelling thinking and it's a, a love pain to old funky German farmhouses and so on, the, the very opposite. So I vote for Corbusier and against Heidegger. Uh, but anyway, mass, what he's saying is once you go to mass production, you're beginning to think about uh, analysis and experiment uh, and so he's advocating that industry on the grand scale must produce the house machine, the mass production house, healthy and morally so, and beautiful in the same way that the working tools and instruments which accompany our existence are beautiful. So here's the idea that if you think rationally about what's involved in making many houses, rather than just focus on here is 
a traditional lair of the kind people have been living in, then what, what new advantages will you get from adopting what we might call the engineering aesthetic? So notice that the thing here is that this is not really Bau culture, it's the Bau, but not the culture in the sense of preserving a culture. It is solely focusing on this idea of the house as a machine for living in. What we immediately notice is that any design process is multifunctional. It has a machine for living in, it's for cooking in, it's for sleeping in, it's for recreating in, it's for conviviality in. And as we fast forward a hundred years, I think for the, the sort of um, living for many people type aspect, this idea remains relevant, but um, our notion of mass production has changed. My first publication when I was a teenager was a letter to the editor in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, they published an article that it, at the rise of the Hallmark cards. Before that, the, the greeting cards were all very stereotyped and very sticky sentiments. And suddenly, the, the, the greeting cards you know about with sort of jokes and funny pictures and so on were, were coming out. And there was a whole range of them instead of just a few. And this article included an interview with a psychologist who said that um, it was very important that um, the, the success of these was because people wanted to express their individuality. So my first publication was a short letter saying, perhaps only in the United States can you mass produce individuality. And the point now is that thanks to, to computers, we can begin to think about mass producing individuality in a much more real sense than choosing from a rack of, of greeting cards. So, so the, the bringing together of computers and architecture is certainly going to be powerful. Whether bringing neuroscience and architecture together I'm not quite so sure. But what I do want to do with the next slide is to emphasize that um, the use of technology doesn't rule out the preservation of culture, that we can, in fact, marry the two. And so I've picked three Japanese examples. So the top one is the katatsu. Now, in the old days in Japan, when people were poor, they would cook over, the, over wood or coal, and then they would take the, the, the hot embers that were left from the cooking and they'd place them in a pit in the floor. And then people would sit around a table with their feet in the pit, not on the embers, uh, and with this blanket spread around them so they could, couldn't afford to heat the whole room, but they could enjoy the residual heat from the fire before they went to bed. And then, of course, unlike the sort of dedicated bedroom with permanent beds we're used to, they would have the futon which would be brought out at night. So the next piece of, so this kotatsu up here is one with an electric heater underneath the table instead of live embers in, in, in the floor, um, but still with a, a hole in the floor for the legs. Um, here is a woman putting out the futon at night, but now there is a hairdryer technology adapted to the purpose of making sure that your bed is warm when you get in after it's been pulled out of the cupboard. And then finally, the, um, the electric rice cooker with all the magical timings in that we've got used to. So these are household furnishings, not architecture. And so one of my confusions is where does uh, the, 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 the architecture, what the French call the meuble, and, and the furniture, the immovable, sorry, other way around, the unmovable building and the movable furnishings of the building. Where's the barrier? I, and, and some architects are very strong on making a firm dividing line between architecture and interior design, whereas some others, like Frank Lloyd Wright, were quite the opposite. There's the charming story of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed this, this home and this was specially designed for this is where the grand piano goes. And the owners of the house said, but we don't play the piano. And Frank Lloyd Wright says, well, you must buy a piano, and this is where you will place it. So, so he certainly didn't, didn't make that boundary. OK. So 
The next part of the, what is inspired by thinking about Corbusier is, is uh, to, to look at the other half of that book cover and say that after all these pages in which he sort of extolled the engineering of airplanes and so on and thought about this can define the problem of the plane, the problem of the automobile, the problem of the ocean liner, so now we can just define the problem of the house and this will come within aesthetics, we, f we suddenly go from saying it will be beautiful in the same way the working tools are beautiful to, and let me just skip to the next slide, um, he devotes page after page to his love of the Parthenon. There's nothing wrong with loving the Parthenon, but he suddenly doesn't worry about the, the Parthenon as a building for worshipping in, or at least was built as a building for worshipping in, or as a a building for creating civil society around or anything like that. He just writes, little by little the Greek temple was formulated, passing from construction to architecture. hundred years later the Parthenon marked the climax of the ascending curve. Each part is decisive and marks the highest point in precision and execution. Proportion is clearly written therein. Phidias, the great sculptor, made the Parthenon. He's sort of imagining that he is the great sculptor of the 20th century. There has been nothing like it anywhere at any period. So he's building there um, an, an aesthetic which, which has nothing to do with the engineering aesthetic. And yet uh, Christopher Jenks, in The Tragic View of Architecture, tries to blend the house as a machine and the Parthenon as a machine. Now, there's a quote here that, that could uh, allow you to think for a moment, and it misled Jenks in my opinion. We are in the Parthenon in the inexorable realm of the mechanical. All this plastic machinery is realized in marble with the rigor that we have learned to apply in the machine. The impression is of naked polished steel. And he will then argue, well, for, for, for Corbusier, both the machine and the Parthenon were timeless and silent. They represented ultimate developments to which one could return for certainty as an absolute check against chaotic or changing human affairs. And I just think this is a mistake. And the, the Parthenon is not a machine. The fact that, that, that Corbusier slipped into that language for a while, there's something totally different between the Parthenon's beauty as judged by the architect or by us when we visit Athens and the, the, the functionality and beauty of a machine. And I, I stress neither air, airplanes are neither s timeless nor silent. And when Corbusier speaks of the Parthenon as plastic machinery, it's a very different notion from machine. It's more that the regularity of the columns and so on, the m precision is that that we might expect of a machine. But it itself is not a machine. And it certainly is totally different from, I think, what he was taking from line as airplanes and automobiles when he said the house is a machine for living in. So to move forward, I, I want to bring um, cybernetics into the argument. Um, because I think what we need now for the 21st century, um, if we're to, to learn from what Corbusier said 100 years ago, inspired by the new machines of his time, then I think we have to move forward into an age of computers and the internet. And as we know, the, that's tied up with artificial intelligence. And as we know, artificial intelligence is in part inspired by the study of the brain. So here's cybernetics. So the, the founding book was by Norbert Wiener. Um, this is the second edition cover, but you get to meet him on, the, on, the, on that cover. So the original book was 1948, and he called it control in communication in animal and machine. Now there was a series of meetings that had been arranged by the Josiah Macy Foundation, chaired by Heinz von Furster, and so after Wiener's book came out, they rechristened their um, series as cybernetics, but now they broadened the definition so they could bring in not just engineers and biologists, but also social scientists and, 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 uh, and so on. Uh, anthropologists, and so they call it circular causal and feedback mechanisms in biological, and now I emphasize it, and social systems. So now you're thinking about the interaction, not only, let's say, of the reflex arc, which gets your knee to, to jerk out when, uh, when you're hit with a hammer and so on, 
where you're looking at the, the feedback and controlling communication within the, the animal or within the machine, um, but you're now extending it to looking at the social system. Uh, my first book, I advertised, Brains, Machines, and Mathematics. And today, as I, I just mentioned, we've now, the term cyber is everywhere, um, from cyber warfare to, to cyber security and so on. And now it's an umbrella term that covers insights from brain research, neural networks, artificial intelligence, computer networks, robotics, and more. So really the, the, the challenge, and I don't have time to meet the challenge, and even if I had time, I'm not quite there to do it justice yet, is to how do we bring the house as a machine for living in to a building of this typology is a building for X, where X includes functions which need cybernetics for their realization, and then trying to, to carry out what obviously was in Corbusier's mind but not made explicit in his book was how do we marry that with a strong aesthetic and emotional sense. So, uh, so I, I've sort of put this slogan up. Um, a house is now not just a machine, it's also a robot. It's also an embrained body for living in. And um, so that's sort of the extension. And as I say, um, how do we reconcile those two voices of Corbusier, the admirer of the engineering aesthetic, and the other of the pure, non-functional architectural aesthetic of the Parthenon. Those two have to be married. And um, the question is, you know, when we do this, will it preserve our culture or radically transform it? And that's sort of the, the question I was bringing in at the beginning. When we look at the, we can either, as Colin would, look at the bow culture in terms of how do we create healthy, enjoyable environments, but that's not really a culture-linked portion of the question. The other is, if there are cultural traditions, what do you value of those traditions? To what extent will you try to preserve or build on them as you develop this healthy, uh, enjoyable environment? Sir? I just did. So, so the, the, the founding book by Wiener in 48 was that during the time leading up to and during the Second World War, there had been a lot of engineering developments. So there was the idea of the server mechanism, the feedback system. There was the idea of communication being carried out through telephone or radio networks and so on. And then he had a friend who was a biologist and began to explore with him ways in which one could analyze the way the human body or the animal body works by seeing that the nervous system was implementing some of these feedback and communication principles. And then, as I said, a few years later then, the group, the, the, these, this foundation series expanded it to say, well, I can look at feedback within a system, uh, a, a machine or, or a body, but I can also look at it in terms of a network of people, for example. So in that case, one famous example of a, a sort of pathological thing is uh, the kid is crying, that upsets the parent who gets cross with the kids, so the kid cries more, and that makes the parent even worse. So there you get an example of feedback going the wrong way around, being amplifying the problem rather than, in general, you want to design the feedback system to minimize the the error, as it were. So those are the sort of starting points. And then from that grew the theory of neural networks, uh, um, and, and now deep learning is the big in thing in terms of, that's one offspring of cybernetics control theory, that the very problems that we've seen with the Boeing 737 are people taking forward those cybernetic principles of automatic control beyond the, the level that was properly tested. Um, no. So as we bring these into buildings, what, what happens as the building becomes more of a, a cybernetic system? What happens of a city when now we're looking at a system in which the people and the diverse buildings become such a thing as we build arteries um, for the new utilities as we, we incorporate the old utilities as we put in the metro system and so on. So we have that cybernetic system both within the individual room interacting with the people in it to the building as a system to, to the buildings in a city or the countryside as a larger system. And so the idea is that 
whether or not the detailed study of the brain itself is going to be important. I think cybernetic computational principles are just an inevitable part of the future of architecture, both in terms of the design of the architecture and in the experience of that architecture as we are part of these, these larger um, cybernetic systems. Is that? Okay, so what I want to talk about for a while um, is the notion of brains for buildings. So if we, if, we, if we study an animal, we've got the idea that we have a nervous system and a body uh, within a social milieu, and it's that integration of brain and body that's crucial. And, and so this has been my obsession for many years to study how the brain works. And so I, I now want to look at the idea that a brain um, and body can be expanded to include, as a special case, buildings, where now there's the physical space of the building, what we think of as our conventional architecture, as it were. We design the, the shell of the building, the windows, the doors, the pathways. Um, but now, more and more, that is not going to only have the old utilities, how do we distribute the water, how do we distribute the electricity, but how do we distribute the information? And now how do we close the loop, not through the, just the, the, the circuitry of the building uh, itself, but through the people interacting uh, within the building. So, as I say, our slogan comes down to each typology of building is, in the first place, as I say, to be thought of as a machine uh, for efficiently supporting X, Y, and Z, but, or Z. Do you say Z or Z in this country? What? Z, Z. good, okay. X, Y, and Z, while offering aesthetic pleasures. So, um, let me go here. I, I, the last time I gave a talk with this slide, it turned out the only thing people remembered from the whole talk was this slide. So I, I hope in your case, w w you'll get more from it. But this is just to make an example of the dramatic way in which brain and body have co-evolved in animals. And this wonderful creature is the star-nosed mole. And you can certainly see in terms of its body these amazing uh, claws uh, on its four, four paws to, to do the digging. But the really fascinating thing for this discussion is these, um, the star nose, which is not what it might look like, two hands, but, but these are very special chemoreceptors which allow the animal, as it's digging its way through, to sense the chemical environment. So it can modify its um, digging to, to not simply make a hole in the ground, but to find uh, insects and other, and worms and so on that it can feed on. And then what's interesting is that if you compare the structure of the, um, the star nose with this part of the brain, um, you can find that for each numbered finger, as it were, uh, of these chemoreceptors, you can find a dedicated part of the brain that does the initial pre-processing for what's coming off that before higher regions of the brain put that together. So I am not advocating that you should build buildings that look like this. But I am trying to get across the idea that, in, that just as natural evolution of animals has co-evolved brain and, and um, body, so I believe that in future we're going to see more and more ways in which just as the putting in the water, putting in the electricity has already placed constraints on current architecture, the, the provision of, of a brain for the building will become more and more important. So here's sort of my sketch um, that got me started was when I study animals or humans, I'm looking at a brain in a body in an external world, and I'm looking at principles which govern the way in which action and perception are integrated, 
as the animal or human moves in, interacts with that world. Whereas here the notion is the body is the, the, the physical plant of the, of the building and then the brain is, is this system that is monitoring activity so that it can adjust what it does in relation to, to the people within it and their needs and interests. So, um, in, the, in rather briefly, I want to just distinguish two things that brains do for bodies. One is homeostasis, the system that keeps your, for example, your, your, the blood sugar and oxygen level within desirable limits in your bloodstream. And then the other thing, which has been very interesting lately, is cognitive social neuroscience, beginning to, to look at the brain, not in terms of just the immediate um, handling of particular stimuli to come up with appropriate actions, but the way in which people interact with each other or animals interact with each other. And of course, our brains have evolved in great part to support us as social, social creatures. So for homeostasis, um, my favorite example, which is um, this one, uh, Jean Nouvel's Institut de Mont Arabe in Paris, um, and, and perhaps some of you have seen it. Um, so there's a whole wall where the panels have these wonderful mechanisms which can change um, the amount of light coming in. And so the, there's a double benefit. Um, one is it helps control the light and heating within the building. The other is it creates a, a wonderful dynamic aesthetics as you perceive the building from the outside. Uh, the trouble was that the machines are so complicated they kept breaking down and so recently they spent millions of euros to restructure this so it now works again uh, after years of, of inactivity. For social interaction, um, homeostasis is, is, is by and large what happens within the body. Social interaction, and this is the building interacting with the people, um, is, as I say, a crucial thing. And if I had a, a whole extra hour, I'd tell you all about mirror neurons and how they interact with the rest of the brain to support social interaction. But I don't have another hour. Um, so let me just tell you about a classic example. Um, so this um, was actually designed by a team that included two uh, computational neuroscientists, Rodney Douglas and Paul Vichour. It was named in honor of Ada Lovelace, who in the 19th century worked with Charles Babbage on his uh, analytical engine. So she is hailed now as the first computer programmer, although that computer didn't actually work. Um, and so uh, the amazing thing about this is that it's, a, if you will, a cybernetic building that welcomed over half a million guests. Um, now, here you, you are in the temple of uh, Philip Beasley, um, who in some sense builds cybernetic spaces, but I don't think they have much in the way of function beyond giving you cybernetic experiences of, a, of stuff that interacts as you move through it. And in a way, this pavilion, I would say, is sort of in between. It's a little bit more functional in terms of doing things with people but it still hasn't reached perhaps the ideal um, of, of where you really think about, hey, a building should do this for its people, and here's a way that the, the cybernetics or the brain can aid it. But anyway, it's just giving you a little flavor. The, um, the, the building has, uh, it's an exhibition space. Within that, there are screens that can provide both particular pictures and mood-setting pictures. Again, there's a sound system that can provide directed computer-composed music to particular groups of people and also create an ambient music with a, to, to provide a sort of general affect. The really exciting innovation is these, uh, these tiles, which both can change color to signal to people, but also can uh, recognize where people are and with simple neural networks can detect how they're moving. And then it will set up it will find people who pay attention to cues it provides, and if so, it will give them the same color tiles and start bringing those tiles together. 
so they can form a group. And then it has various routines for playing with those people. And, and the full software is interesting, and again, no time for it, but in some sense, the design of the thing is that she has emotions and wants to play with visitors. So she has a, a survival index that, that depends on, on um, engaging people in, in the activities that she can provide before they're, they're ushered out of the, the space to let in the next group of people. But I, but I think already here we see the, the idea of you've got sensors, you've got effectors, you've got an internal state of a building that wants to achieve something with the people inside the building and, and is able to do so. So I, I, although that's already 27 years old, I think that's an outstanding example of, of what I'm hoping to see more of. Now I mentioned mirror neurons just very quickly. Um, these are five Italians who worked together in, in Parma in Italy. And they were studying um, neurons whose firing differentiated depending on what sort of things the monkey was doing with its hands. So you see some of the, if you did a precision pinch, some cells would fire a power grasp, other cells would fire. And then one day, uh, Leo Fagassi, the guy in the middle, was um, placing a, 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 a piece of food on a tray prior to handing the, handing the tray to the monkey so that he could record the activity of the cell as the monkey did a particular grasp. But the, the, the cells were tied up to a loudspeaker, and to his amazement, as he was moving his hand to do the precision pinch, the loudspeaker started going brrr, and they discovered that there was a subset of the neurons, which they called the mirror neurons, that are active not only when the monkey does an act itself, what he recognizes others doing it. And, and so a lot of my effort in recent years has been to understand the mirror system and also, though, to chart what is going on in the brain beyond the mirror system. So here's Alice going through the looking glass, and that's my slogan, beyond the mirror, um, of, of how do different parts of the brain work together. Let me just give you one example of, a, of data related to that. And... Um, this idea was, um, I think I'm running out of time. So anyway, the story here was that uh, in the experiments, what they do is they show short video clips, no sound, and then they 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 do a brain scan to see what parts of the brain were activated for that. And if you look at the left, we have, um, here's a little area that seems to, have activity correlated in this case with the recognition of the facial movements. And so we see that whether it's a, a video of a human biting, a monkey biting, or a dog biting, a dog biting, we get roughly the same activity in every case. But over here, the, the videos were a human talking, a, a, a monkey making communicative orofacial gestures like teeth chattering or lip smacking and a dog barking. And now as we go down looking at the orofacial mirror area, we go from a lot of activity to very little activity to no activity. So the idea is you've got a system that is, in this case, recognizing your own actions, but clearly um, we recognize the dog barking, so there's a lot of other machinery. I think I've almost talked myself, haven't I, out of the relevance of mirror neurons to buildings, because presumably if the building recognizes what you're doing, it's not going to do the same thing. It'd be fairly gruesome if it did, but um, okay. So please don't read this. Um, we don't have time. But the idea was to think about what would be a kitchen that could help people who weren't very good at cooking uh, in terms of getting stuff out of the fridge for them or uh, monitoring what their actions were to see if they were doing the right things. And um, the, the design that my students came up with in a project at, at USC was the whole project. The aim was to say, I've taught you about modeling the brain for a semester. Think about a, a system for an intelligent room that interests you where some of the subsystems, the one shown in blue in this case, implement something of the neural network design. So this was a step in that direction of, of thinking about building a brain. But I, I really am out of time. 
So let me just come up with a, a couple of slides to close this out. Um, a little further west from you in Calgary, uh, a husband-wife team, Branko Kolarevich and Vera Parlak, are working together. They put out this book a few years ago on di building dynamics. This is the idea of what happens is you really think seriously about buildings that whose parts can move. So this could be something very practical like changing the profile of a building so that when there's a heavy wind, the, uh, the, uh, the building will not be chilled as much by the wind as it would otherwise. There's also a, a very nice house for a guy with a wheelchair where his study actually can move down to the ground floor and he can work in his study there and then it will lift him up to the second floor where he can wheel off to his bedroom. But anyway, so, so, but, but what is interesting or amusing here is not uh, this, but this is sort of the idea, not really thinking about the brain very much or the senses very much, but more about what dynamics can you have. And I'd say it's, a lot of it is more Beazlian in the sense that it's making buildings that, that create interesting spectacles, uh, festival events and so on, rather than perhaps filling everyday functions. But anyway, what, what Branko did was he sent me this link to a science fiction story by J.G. Ballard, and look it up if you want to. It's The Thousand Dreams of Stella Vista. So Stella Vista is a, a housing development where the buildings were psychotropic. So they would change shape and color in response to the emotions of their inhabitants. But they had a memory so that if you moved into a house, it would behave in ways that, respond, that recollected the emotional states of the previous inhabitant. And so the, this guy moves into a house that has these strong emotions of a neurotic movie star who lived there and Finally, his wife divorces him and leaves because she can't stand there, but he, he stays there. But um, anyway, that's sort of an amusing extrapolation of one way in which we can imagine designing a building to at least respond to your emotional state in a way that provides cues either to enhance a, a pleasant state or, or lower a state of tension and so on. Um, and then it would, you'd want it to be an adaptive building to remember things about you. It might learn that certain cues are helpful and certain are not. But the idea of going to the point where a building forgets who, you, who the new inhabitant is and starts playing off the routines that are just reflecting the prior emotion becomes the, the, the subject of a, a big science fiction uh, speculation. So... Um, Implicit in what I just said is, is that I think part of the cybernetic machine is going to be that it learns things about the users. And that might be um, learning about the particular people who, who use the building, or it may be more like modern deep learning and data mining, where learning about lots of people from different buildings, you begin to build in architectural dynamics that reflects what we know about people. And then that gets us into the whole thing that we have anyway with the internet. You know, how much of your reactions to a building should be private? How much are you prepared to share across the internet so that deep learning can mine that? But I, I just want to, to make one comment before the final uh, little burst. And that is that Stuart Brand, um, I think there's only one person besides myself here old enough to remember, but he put out a book called The Whole Earth Catalog that was a, a big uh, document of the 1960s. But later on, he wrote this architectural book called when, How Buildings Learn. And, and the point is, the title is not the one I'm emphasizing here. There, the idea was, and, and you, of course, your architecture school is a particular example of this, of you have a building designed for a particular purpose, time goes by, how do you repurpose the building? And in some sense, he was advocating how in designing a building now, you might be thinking ahead to the fact that somebody might possibly want to reconfigure it later. Whereas for me, um, I'm really thinking about how in future a building can learn in the sense that it has something like a, a neural network architecture that allows it to learn in terms of the interactions it can have, maybe changing the shape it has, and um, going on from there. 
So let me close three slides, I think, with this quote from Kevin Roche that I think is very important for us to bear in mind um, as we think about architecture and as we think about bow culture. So he said, for him, the most important thing one can achieve in any building is to get people to communicate with each other. That's really essential to our lives. We are not just individuals, we are part of a community. The old time villages did that and then we destroyed all that in the 19th century when we started to build these vast expansions where there was no center, there is no community. Now, in his career, the, the, the response was more to build uh, beautiful buildings for a, a large company and provide a, a good local environment for them. But I, I want to carry that forward to close with a return to the bow culture theme. Actually, let me go here. No, let me go back. All right, three more slides. It's going to be all right. So this is the building that won the World Architecture Festival Building of the Year Award last year. And I have to put in a disclaimer there that the ha of Woha is a cousin of my wife's. But where in other circumstances showing one's wife's cousin's architecture might be inappropriate, when your wife's cousin's architecture firm has won the World Architecture Building Award, um, it's appropriate. So this is um, a single building in the heart of Singapore called Kampong Admiralty. So uh, Kampong is in Malaysian a village. So this is a vertical village. So there's a people, it's multi-story, people's plaza in the lower forum, medical center, community, then the community park, and then above that, the, the apartments. Uh, the people's plaza is fully public, porous and pedestrianized ground plane designed as a community living room within which the public can participate in organized events, join in the season's festivities, shop or eat at the Hawker Center. On the se That's interesting, the Hawker Center, there's sort of the, the cultural thing, but one of the few cultural things, the street food of Singapore, for all of you who saw crazy rich Asians. The breezy tropical plaza is shaded and sheltered by the medical center above, allowing activities to continue. And then sort of the Kevin Roche thing is residents are active connectively come together to exercise, chat, or attend community farms at the community park, an intimately scaled, elevated village green. There are buddy benches at shared entrances to encourage the seniors to come out of their homes and interact with their neighbors. Um, and the units you know, are designed for good ventilation and optimum daylight and so on. But I, I think this idea of the, the sort of the eco-architecture, the green movement coupled with this sense of community uh, is pretty important. Now before I get to my last slide, I just want to show the slide of the architectural project that turned Woha from doing residential buildings to, to becoming perhaps Singapore's leading architectural firm. And this is the subway station they designed in Singapore. And it's, it's amazing. So you're if you, if you see here are the, the elevators on the other end, we're at the top of the, sorry, escalators at this end. And they've done this radical thing of, instead of having the, the platform level cut off to be accessed by tunnel-like escalators, they've cut right through. And so you have this curve wall against the flat wall and then this view down the escalators to this uh, expanse below and with that they no longer had to worry about residential clients anymore. So the final slide is to step back. So let's just go back and look at this slide again, a view of the, uh, of, of the Kampong as sort of seen from the inside and I want to close with this aerial view where you see it placed within the urban complex of Singapore which is a small, very small island country uh, with millions upon millions of people and the population growing. Um, we can see a park in the, in the distance. Uh, we can see an urban transit in the, in the center, but nonetheless, the basic thing is boring apartment building after boring apartment building stuck in. And then here is this, this building providing all this accommodation 
with all the green space within the complex, with the, 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 the common use below, the, the residents above, the emphasis on providing spaces for people to get together. And so I just close with this question, could this be the seed for a new approach to the mantra of Jane Jacobs, who worried about cities in terms of urban villages in a way where people could come together, where now you have vertical villages, community on the small scale with public parks, metro systems, and the presentation, preservation of cultural sites um, for the community on the large scale? And I think the answer is yes. And then the subsidiary question, given the middle part of my talk, is will cybernetics matter in realizing this future? Thank you very much.